Good afternoon. Welcome to today's PASA webinar, Leading Causes of Railroad Pedestrian Accidents and Injuries. This webinar will discuss station platform accidents, track-related track accidents, and railroad crossing accidents. Specifically, today's presenter will cover platform to rail gap, to rail car gap, crowd management, slip, trip, and fall, premature door crossing, sudden train movement, and the role of the train operator in relation to station platform accidents. With regard to track-related accidents, the presenter will cover right-of-way trespassing, falling from station platform, sidewalk crossing, and crossovers, otherwise referred to as pathways. And with regard to crossing accidents, the presenter will cover components of grade crossings, design considerations, and solutions. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Carl Berkowitz. Dr. Berkowitz has 48 years of transportation and traffic engineering experience. He has served as a litigation consultant and held various positions in industry, government, higher education, with extensive experience in planning, design, safety, security, construction, maintenance, operations, and management. He holds a BCE in civil engineering and an MBA in industrial management from the City College of New York, and an MS in Transportation Planning and a PhD in Transportation Planning and Engineering from NYU Poly. In addition to his work involving pedestrians in virtually every form of transportation and its safety, including aviation and maritime, Dr. Berkowitz has written numerous reports and articles for major publications, chair task forces, appeared on national television and radio, and made numerous scholarly presentations worldwide. He holds memberships in many transportation professional associations. Dr. Barkowitz's areas of expertise include accident studies, slips, trips, and falls, pedestrian accidents, perception reaction capability, subway and commuter rail accidents, speed and distance analysis, and railroad grade crossing. Dr. Berkowitz would like to field questions throughout today's presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature located on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your question to the presenter. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. We do ask that you take time to call the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished presenter, Dr. Carl Berkowitz. Dr. Dr. Berkowitz, the program is all yours. Thank you very much, Matt. I look forward to uh, making this presentation. It's uh, a very extensive presentation, and hopefully we will be able to cover all the aspects. Uh, whatever we're not able to cover, we'll be able to, uh, the, the participants will be able to see online. Anyway, uh, I'd like to begin by just making this general statement that we tend to blame the pedestrian in, in, as being the person responsible in any kind of accident because they're not careful or watching where they're going. And this is a myth we need to uh, dispel. In terms of the platform accidents, I'm going to talk about the rail car gap, crowd management, slip trips and falls, premature door openings, and the role of the train operator who we sometimes always try to blame as the cause of an accident, but that's not necessarily always the case either. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, the materials that I'm presenting are in areas where there aren't really standards that have been established. And what I try to do is I try to present guidelines and ideas which will help the, uh, the attorneys decide the merits of a case, whether a case is is, uh, is one of merit or, or not of merit, or to understand what's taking place in that particular accident environment. What the, the standard should be, and in most cases, this is the, uh, the standard is one of uh, uh, one of consensus that may not necessarily be of the highest standard, but may be, because of compromise, be a lesser than a higher standard. There is a number in the in the area of uh, pedestrian safety in, in the rail environment. 
Uh, there are a number of organizations that uh, provide standards, and this is a, a list of those organizations, each of them having separate activities and presenting uh, standards in their areas of expertise. Unfortunately, they don't cover a lot of the areas that uh, accidents, uh, the standards that relate to accidents that are commonly occurring. And that's why I put together the kinds of material I put together. And I would call my information more guidelines than standards because standards we tend to uh, accept as something that's been nationally accepted. Let's look first at the platform to rail car gap. And in, in the right hand corner you see the famous uh, London Transport symbol mine the gap, which is uh, probably the most anywhere in terms of uh, platform to rail car gap uh, safety. There are two types of gaps. There's a horizontal gap, which is the distance between the platform and the edge of the train door threshold. And the second gap, which uh, gets less consideration but is equally as important, is the vertical gap. And that's the distance between the top of the platform and the edge of the train door threshold, as as you can see in the the right-hand picture, which shows the both the horizontal and vertical gap. The first picture is very interesting. This is a picture that was taken in 1904 on the opening of the New York City subway system. And this is the, the City Hall stop on the uh, RRT uh, subway system in New York. And that very day, there was a gap accident. And this is, uh, you can see a very sharp curve. And that's where the accident occurred. Uh, this is just showing uh, the two different problems that exist in addition to the vertical and horizontal gap, and that's the nature of the platform. If it's a convex platform, you could see that the center door would be closer to the platform, and the outer doors would be further away, and conversely, when you have a concave platform, that is, where the platform curves away from the passenger, the center of the car, the rail car, will be further away, and the ends of the rail car will be closer to the platform. These are uh, conceptually the types of things to be considered to ensure that a passenger has safe boarding or, or deboarding or alighting from the train. Such things as how the accessibility is, the warning systems, is the boarding level, is there clarity of boarding, is it clear, is it discernible, are there detectable warnings, uh, what kind of information is provided, what is the visibility. These are all these uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 items are things that should be taken into consideration to determine whether or not a particular boarding situation uh, over a gap or where there is no gap is safe uh, for the pedestrian. There are two types of uh, platforms. Actually, there are really a, a third type, which uh, is not illustrated here. Here we have the low-level platform, which is the ground level, which is very common uh, around the United States, and more common in, uh, in metro systems is the high-level platform. But in many places now, they are putting in what they call mid-level platforms, which are somewhere between the low-level and the high-level. And this is in Tokyo, uh, where passengers get a little help boarding. Just to look at it from a graphic point of view, the stepping distance, uh, the distance that an individual would have to take from the platform to the rail car, or from the rail car to the platform, is made up both of a vertical and horizontal distance. And when we're considering a gap, it's really the cumulative distance of the vertical and the horizontal distance, not strictly the vertical or the horizontal distance. Platform crowd management is a, a very interesting subject, and one uh, where it's, it's kind of difficult to determine, is a platform crowded or is a platform not crowded? And there are a lot of things that we can do to determine whether a platform is crowded or not crowded. And in this case, uh, we would all say that this is a crowded platform. And the things that need to be taken into consideration are the layout, the environment, how the crowd flows, the arrival and departure of trains, individual factors of the passenger, the types of passenger. Is it a passenger in Tokyo or a passenger in New York or a passenger in Miami? Things of that nature. Uh, to make it easy, for myself to determine whether or not a, a platform is crowded, uh, 
it's very difficult to measure. If you wanted to determine if a platform was crowded or not, you'd probably have to use time-lapse photography or take videos or have dozens of experts uh, or engineers out there counting passengers crossing the point in time. And since uh, situations happen in, uh, in nanoseconds sometimes, you need something that's more efficient. And what I've done is I've developed what I call crowd queue. And if we want to know if a platform is crowded or not crowded, we could use what I call my crowd queues, which I've also related to the universal standard uh, for crowding, which is a level of service. And by just looking at the crowd and my crowd queues, you can determine whether or not your station is or platform or any area where there are pedestrians, whether it's crowded or not. These are the many factors that go into crowding. I'm not going to go into one, each one individually. Uh, you can come and look at them at your leisure, but there are many, many factors that contribute to crowding. Whether it's at, at a railroad platform or a station or an intermediate area, or even a, a, a music event or a, a sports event, uh, the crowding factors uh, all come into play. I mentioned before the level of service, and uh, there's a lot of information in the literature on this. Uh, this is, uh, was developed by Dr. Fruin, uh, who I worked as a, a graduate student, uh, a graduate assistant to in the development of this. And basically, he developed a level of service similar to what was developed for automobiles and, and vehicles, uh, for pedestrians walking, and for pedestrians queuing up in areas. And this is all relates back to the evaluation of crowding. Uh, how do you calculate level of service? Well, here for your convenience is a step-by-step -step procedure which can be used to calculate the level of service uh, at, at any location. This could be used uh, for platform stairs, uh, escalators, elevators, ramps, what have you. Let's now take a look at slip trips and falls. Uh, and in and, and these particular environments, in the platform, rail car, escalator ramps, and stair environment. Uh, the preventive measures of slip trips and falls are quite simple, and that is when an, 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 a hazard is identified, try to eliminate that hazard. And the way to eliminate the hazard, hazard in the first place is by having passive and, and active devices uh, to provide information to the pedestrian and to keep the areas where pedestrians are trans, uh, trans, uh, transporting themselves through clean and maintain and, and repair and make sure that the walking area doesn't have gaps. Uh, the gaps could be from expansion joints. And if there are expansion joints, sometimes the filler material, because of changes in temperature, uh, uh, rises above the surface. And sometimes because of the caustic materials that are used to clean surfaces, they become damaged. All this has to be taken into consideration as part of preventive measures. Uh, some of the platform issues are, you know, the, having a level of a coefficient of friction recommended by the various standards of 0.5 uh, and to make sure that repairs are done in a proper manner and that worn areas are taken care of. Stair issues, uh, when it's important that stairs are designed according to standards and codes. And some of the issues that involve stairs is that the riser height is greater than recommended, which is generally in the neighborhood of seven inches, and the tread depth is less than what is recommended, which is 11 inches. In some cases, the riser height and the tread depth are part of a code and is a, and is a requirement in many building codes and other facility codes. And also, if it's a, it's important to have a, a proper width of the stair to accommodate more than one-way traffic. As you can see, uh, uh, one stair here just accommodates one-way traffic, which creates a problem sometimes because people are quite impatient and they're going to be heading in the other direction. Ramp inch issues are somewhat similar to uh, some of the issues that are related to stairs, and the slope is important. You want to make sure that the slope is not too steep, especially for seniors, uh, and also that there are there are handrails and other uh, proper treatments of the surface so that the surface is safe for walking upon. Escalators, uh, one of the 
uh, it's interesting that in, in Russia, the escalators move almost as fast as the trains, and yet they manage to control it at the beginning of the escalator, at the end of the escalator, so that people could safely get off and on the escalators. Uh, it's important to make sure that pedestrians uh, are able to ride the escalator safely, and, and that children don't get their clothing and fingers and other things caught, and that their emergency uh, accommodations, in case something uh, goes wrong, to immediately be able to stop the escalator. Uh, passengers, pedestrians, uh, passengers who ride trains uh, sometimes get thrown by the uh, initial acceleration or deceleration of the train, of the train, or a sudden stop, and this. Uh, uh, rate of change of, of acceleration or deceleration is known as the jerk rate. In many modern uh, rail equipment, uh, passenger equipment, uh, jerk rate is built into the control system so that the, the operator cannot exceed the jerk rate, but min, mo most of the equipment in the United States, the jerk rate has to be controlled by the operator, and uh, this is important to ensure that passengers can ride on that vehicle standing and also to be able to take a seat safely without being thrown. Uh, door, train door incidents are quite interesting. Uh, one that I found extremely inter interesting is the one of a passenger, and in fact you can find the picture on the internet. Uh, for civility, I haven't shown it, but they show a passenger mooning other passengers, and while he is mooning the other passengers, he got his butt stuck in the door which uh, is quite interesting. Uh, door incidents uh, come a very uh, uh, wide variety. Uh, some of the types of door incidents that are commonplace are where doors fail to open or close, the door interlock system fails, especially that can happen on, on buses uh, from time to time and also on, on, on rail cars. Uh, where the door opens, it, uh, where, the, where the, the train is not platformed, uh, we have incorrect door operations. Uh, doors have been known to open on the wrong side. The train comes in on one side, and the doors open on the other side. Uh, uh, obstructions sometimes are not detected, and a, a stroller or a person gets dragged. Uh, a freewheeling door panel where the door keeps opening and closing and the train keeps moving. And sometimes where the door fails to completely close, the, uh, the, Nas the National Academy of Science Transportation Research Board as an ongoing program in this area where various transportation properties uh, provide information on their door problems which are shared with other transportation properties but not with the general public. A summary of this uh, study can be found on the site of the Transportation Research Board. Uh, another area of concern is, of course, is in car falls where Sometimes it's a result of unsafe operation of the train driver as a result of a sudden jerk or a sway uh, because of the car suspension system might be out of uh, maintenance. And the solutions, of course, are quite simple for these types of problems. Uh, operator in human error. Uh, the first thing when an accident happens, we tend to blame the operator, but uh, in many cases the operator is acted uh, with due diligence and has done a very good job, and because of the time and the opportunity the operator has to respond to a, an emergency event is insufficient to stop, the accident occurs. And sometimes it is the operator's fault. And some of the errors that have uh, been noted of operators, uh, which I have shown here in a cumulative form, are such things as attention, perception, their knowledge, uh, violation of rules, uh, errors in procedure, slip, a lapse, mistakes, fatigue. These are the categories of human error that a lot of ac accidents can be categorized in. Uh, we speak a lot in, in the field uh, about perception reaction time, and that's how fast it, it takes, how much time does it take to react to, a, to an emergency event. Uh, when uh, a person involved in an accident is asked to indicate when do they apply the emergency uh, equipment, they'll say instantly. And we know that's not possible because there's a process that has to go through, and that's the perception to the reaction. And this can take anywhere from a second to two and a half seconds, uh, depending on the skill level of the person uh, 
perceiving and reacting. An important thing to consider is that you don't want to overburden an operator, and this, if you provide the operator with undertaking too many tasks at the same time, then the attention cannot be directed to where it is most important to be directed. And this is, uh, this concept applied attention, and this is how rapidly can the operator switch from one task to the other, and how widely can the operator deploy its attention, the operator's attention across the field of vision in the area of, in the working environment that the operator is working in. And one of the things that's important is attention to control. And I'm not going to get into this in too much detail. You can come back and look at this at, uh, at your leisure. But these are some of the things that are important and that play a role in attention control. Excuse me, Carl. We have a couple questions that have come in. I was wondering if you uh, would like to address them at this time. Sure, I would. Let's take a look okay, at that. Are there guides? Okay, taking the first question I have here. Are there guides for acceptable jerk rates? Yes, there are. Uh, there are there are standards. Uh, uh, one is published by the American Society of Civil Engineers as part of uh, of their People Mover uh, research program. Uh, the uh, various industry groups have in their literature information, and I have some information that I posted on the slide. Let's see, that, that covers the first two questions on acceptable jerk rate. Uh, from Kathy Minahan, uh, are pressure sensitive train doors effective to prevent door closing injuries or at least moderate the severity? Uh, yes, sir. there are standards uh, for the pressure sensitive uh, strips on the doors and, and they're mostly uh, designed for if a pressure of 15 or 20 pounds, and in some cases 40 pounds, if anything is exerted on that strip, the doors will open. And uh, they're, they're not in as many systems as one would hope. Uh, they're, they're, they are in several systems. Uh, Washington Metro, for one, has the system, and I believe theirs is designed for that 25-pound pressure. Let's see what else we have here. From, uh, from Melissa, is there some type of sensor that prevents the door train to start when some, something is between the door? Well, the, the, the two things that are available is this pressure sensitive strip and, uh, and if the doors are forced open, the, uh, the conductor and the train, or the train operator will know that the doors are open and the train will not proceed until all the doors are closed. Uh, through visual observation, one could determine because there are lights at each door location to indicate whether or not the doors are open. So there are many fail-safe systems. It's when when a, a limb gets caught uh, and the door is pretty close to closing uh, that the problems occur. And, and some of the systems where carriages have been closed, uh, on, the doors closed on carriages or persons, uh, it was sometimes due to the inattention of the person who uh, needed to observe the door entries and not uh, and not permit the train to proceed until the door was cleared. I hope that answers those questions. Matt? Uh, yeah, we have one more that just came in from James uh, who asked, are there any statistical databases we can use on what the nor quote-unquote norms for incidents or foreseeable issues? There are databases uh, out there, the Federal Railroad Administration posts accident information, but a, a lot of information is not posted and, to the public, mainly for the fact uh, train operators would like uh, their operators, the train, uh, the management companies that operate the system would like their operators to report near misses or almost situations, and it is believed that if this information is posted, uh, these operators would be reluctant to provide this information to the databases, and this information would not be able to be used and able to prove the safety, you know, prove the safety of situations and reduce accidents in the future. So what we can find online from the Federal Railroad Administration is gross information, gross data, and it's usually of accidents and not of the near-miss uh, type of situation, which is also very in important in terms of preventing accidents. Okay, great. Thank you, Carl. I don't see any questions, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content. Okay, doke. Uh, operator and safety, uh, here we have 
uh, the categories of uh, that we should, you know, that should be considered, you know, the operator's focus, is he, observe, is he, is the he or she operator observing the right of way, uh, was the event expected or unexpected, uh, was the operator operating in a predictable manner and lawfully, was the, the work day long, uh, an excessively long and busy day, uh, was there problems with uh, the operator focusing attention, and was the operator given uh, uh, the expertise to uh, be able to deal with an emergency. Let's uh, take a look now at track-related accidents. Uh, that's on, uh, in terms of right-of-way trespass, falling from station platforms, uh, sidewalk crossings and crossovers, uh, which we sometimes refer to as pathways. Uh, this is a, just a quick rundown of the number of accidents that occur in the United States that result in fatalities from enter entering the, uh, the right-of-way, and you can see that this is quite a, a significant number. It's been decreasing over time, and uh, a lot of people say that it's because of improvements. Uh, and uh, there's another group of people saying that the number has been reduced mainly for the fact that there are less crossings, that there's been a concerted effort in the United States to reduce the number of crossings by either closing them or by having a great cross elimination. And here we have uh, statistics in terms of pedestrian rail incidents. One of the things that uh, the layman fails to take in mind that it's not so easy to stop a train. Uh, even when the emergency brake is applied, and I have a table, uh, the emergency brake is, is not something that can uh, enables a train to stop instantaneously. The train uh, is moving, and the normal braking, as in relate, and in relation to the emergency braking, it, it's not uh, twice as fast to stop the train. Uh, Train takes a lot of time. There are a lot of elements that come into play between perceiving a dangerous situation and being able to take an action. And that time could take at least a second. And if a train is moving at 40 miles an hour, that one second is, is 60 feet. That's a, a quite a distance. And in many cases, that's the length of the of one train car. There are various also track speeds and and each uh, and every track has a, a speed uh, that is determined based upon a classification. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a closed system like a subway or a metro or a light rail system, and, and it doesn't involve different types of uh, uh, trains like passenger trains and freight trains, it's a mixed system. The system can set their own standards based on safety for for the trackage. Uh, but these are those that are set by the Federal Railroad Administration for mixed-use trackage. Okay, this, let's look at the emergency braking concept. Uh, as I pointed out before, uh, it takes time to react, and then, it, and then upon reacting, the, and the emergency equipment is, is used, whether it's the, the mushroom, the, uh, the, the uh, master controller, or a, a rope, or whatever it is, uh, it all takes time. And uh, this time, uh, can result in distance, and that train moves over a certain per, uh, distance over that period of time. Uh, just to give you an example, at a speed of 10 miles an hour, in, uh, in, in one second, at 10 miles an hour, a train moves 15, se uh, 15, 15 uh, feet, and then three seconds moves 44 feet. And if we look at the other way around, 50 feet uh, would take uh, three and a half seconds at 10 miles an hour. Just make it 40 miles an hour, and you can see the significance of the speed. Uh, this is information from uh, the New York City Transit Authority, where they conducted numerous tests over a long period of uh, over a period of time, and this was published in uh, 1988. Uh, and you can see the difference between emergency braking and full service braking, and and you can see that if it's an empty train or a full train, that that also plays a significant role. The heavier the train, the longer it takes to stop, and you can see that the improvement in braking is uh, is only 50% uh, an empty train, and it's only uh, 75, it's only uh, 10 feet more in a, in a fully loaded train at a 10 mile an hour speed. Uh, one of the things that bothers me and I think encourages young children to play on the tracks, I found these in, um, in, in publications uh, 
general publications. Uh, one is from a bridal magazine, and the others are, you see how they glamorize children uh, marching on the tracks. Uh, that's a wonderful example that we're setting uh, uh, the safety of children on tracks. And these are the factors that affect uh, uh, an individual's decision to walk on tracks. In my uh, uh, interviewing of young people, why are they crossing the tracks? And they, they always come up with the, the statement that it's the shortest distance between two points. And, uh, and a lot of it is due to peer pressure where one student is urged to do it by another student. And they, are, they go out there and they, and they walk on the tracks. And it's important to make uh, right away safe for youngsters. Uh, this can be done through uh, many uh, different ways, uh, but probably in, in, the, in the suburban rural areas, some, perhaps the best way is by educating and making the youngsters aware how dangerous it is to walk on the tracks. Where there are areas where there are a lot of uh, train crossing activities, uh, these are some of the things that can be done to make the right of way safe. Uh, Fencing, uh, fencing on the perimeters or inter-track fencing works very well. Uh, there are now uh, studies being done for intrusion control and the Federal Railroad Administration and the U.S. Department of Transportation at their Cambridge Research Center is working on intrusion control systems where the system will identify uh, intruders into the system and a lot of this has to do with uh, facial recognition and other recognition systems that are part of the uh, Homeland Security programs in the United States. And they are using these systems uh, not only for the right-of-way, but also for uh, railroad crossings. Uh, uh, despite everything that is being done, I had an experience uh, in my own neighborhood. I live in a, in a retirement community, and we have a railroad crossing at the beginning of our community. And for some reason or other, the gates came down, and the train didn't come for like a minute and a half, and the car right in front of me uh, went uh, around the gates, and 10 seconds later, uh, this is a senior citizen driving, uh, less than 10 seconds later, the train came. Thank God nothing happened. But that uh, uh, shows uh, what people, you know, what people are doing, and these are not good things to take place. This is uh, part of that intrusion study, and you can see how the equipment has picked up these intruders on the tracks. There, there are various uh, approaches that are used. I, I mentioned the fencing. This is the intertrack fencing you have here, and then you have the uh, the perimeter fencing, the right of way fencing. Uh, combination of two uh, can be great deterrents in preventing uh, people from using the tracks. Uh, signage does not work very well with children. <laughs> These are examples of some of the signs. Uh, they seem like they're easy to read, but when you go back and ask the children, the young people, do they read the sign? They say, what sign? Uh, if it has more than one word, uh, it seems like the children find it difficult to read. There is a program, a national program called Operation Lifesaver, which has as its goals and objectives to uh, uh, teach uh, children about the safety of, uh, of the right-of-way, and this is a, a program that has been adopted by all the railroads and all the State Department of Transportation. It's a very active program. It provides education, enforcement, and engineering. And in many cases, it's even gone further. And I have pictures. They have uh, what they call children railroad schools. And uh, we have one on Long Island, where I live. And in Australia, just like everyone who drives a car has to take a, uh, a railroad course. Uh, 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 in, in Australia, every child uh, has to take a railroad course before they're permitted to walk, practically speaking. And this is some of the uh, safety programs that are out there, uh, some effective and some less effective. And these programs have been around a long time. And here's a wonderful example of, of how people tend – these are uh, actual pictures, and these are uh, in front of moving trains, and it's absolutely mind-boggling sometimes. Uh, let's look at the uh, issue of passengers falling on tracks. Oh, we're going to take a quick Q&A break here, right? Okay, that'll be fine. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions in the queue, and for uh, the attendees out there, if you have a question, uh, please use the chat feature um, or the Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your question. 
Carl, going back to the uh, beginning of your presentation, what are some of the industry guidelines and standards for horizontal and vertical gaps? Uh, the only standards that basically exist are the American Disability Act, where they spell out a horizontal vertical gap. Uh, those are standards, uh, and they only apply to new new properties and not to existing properties. Uh, many of the uh, uh, properties out there have their own guidelines. I wouldn't call it standards, but there are guidelines. There have been studies that have been done, uh, particularly in in Europe, uh, where they've determined that a, a combination of a horizontal and vertical gap that exceeds approximately seven and a half inches uh, becomes a dangerous situation. The uh, tendency is not to establish, in the transportation industry, there's a tendency not to establish too many standards and to allow the properties to come up with their own guidelines and, and, and determine their own safety features. Uh, 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 Senator McCaskill of Maryland has found this is not a particularly acceptable, and she is trying to introduce standards that will, uh, I mean, new legislation that will make the Federal Transit Administration a similar agency to the Federal Railroad Administration to begin to establish uh, guidelines and standards in all areas of safety. There are two studies that have been done in this area, one by the American Public Transit Association and the Federal Railroad Administration, where they give you uh, guidelines in terms of conducting a study of your of of, a, of railroad properties to determine the acceptable uh, uh, gap, uh, horizontal and vertical gap. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl. We have another question here from Blake who asks, um, are you familiar with the OLI campaigns um, that were run by the uh, railroad industry? I, 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 I'm not an expert on it, but I've seen it, yes. I've seen some of their literature. Uh, he's, he's just asking if you have the, an opinion on the effectiveness of those campaigns. I think that when it comes to uh, children and they're going into the schools, I think it has a, an impact. Uh, the best time to train somebody is not when they're 18, is when they're three, four, five, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Uh, they they are more apt to want to learn and more apt to apply what they've learned. 18-year-olds know everything. They're experts. Well, I, I would say probably 15, 16, 17, 18. They're experts, they're invulnerable, and they know the answers to everything, and there's nothing in all in the world that we can teach them. Okay, excellent. We have a question here from James who asks, do trains have black box recorders which allow you to determine the speed and brake application, among other things? Yes. Uh, uh, not every train has them. Uh, uh, there is a, a movement afoot uh, to have all trains and even buses to have either black boxes or video cameras, uh, video cameras ahead. Uh, black boxes are not the only downloads of information that are provided by trains. There are hundreds of other download informations which are usable to determine braking and speed. They're what we call trackside downloads, and there are maintenance downloads which are additionally made. Uh, most of us are familiar with maintenance downloads. Uh, if you have a car that was made in the last 10 years, you go into the dealer and he downloads from the the, the, uh, the car's computer information on maintenance and operations. Well, trains have the same information, same type of uh, information available. So you have those kinds of downloads. You have uh, you have trackside downloads, which deal with the blocks and signals and 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 the and the uh, applications of the grade crossing signals and and gates. There's lots and lots of information that's downloaded beyond the black box. Oh, by the way. It does give uh, speed information, and uh, and also in tenths of a second gives information on the actions that would, took place prior to the accident and after the accident. Okay, excellent. Uh, we have a question here from Brielle who asks, um, and I guess this is very specific, it's for the New York City MTA. Is there a minimum number of conductors on each train, depending on the length of the train? Are the MTA guidelines public and accessible? Uh, now, they operate uh, several different kinds of equipment. Uh, let's take the subway. In the subway, they, they have two types of operations. Uh, one operation has a conductor which is stationed in the middle of the train, and they have a train operator. In the automated systems, you just have a train operator. Uh, in the commuter rails, and they operate uh, 
uh, two systems. They operate Metro North and the Long Island Railroad, and the number of conductors and system conductors depends upon uh, the number of passengers uh, that have to be accommodated. Yeah, they, they serve a fare collection and opening and closing the doors and other functions in terms of ensuring the safety of passengers. Uh, and that uh, can vary. Uh, there is always more than one, though, on, on the trains. Uh, as to the exact number, I'm not exactly sure, but I usually uh, see at least two and sometimes more when I ride the train. Okay, so we have two more questions. Um, this one comes from William Mapp. Are you seeing more use of the type of railroad crossing gates like in Europe where all lanes of traffic are blocked from a crossing or both sides of the track? Actually, I have some pictures of, of some of that, and most likely we won't be able to get to it, but uh, you're going to post that information online. Uh, there are some systems that are being used in Europe that haven't been applied here as yet. In fact, uh, in Europe, they have uh, gates that can resist impact of a vehicle. They can stop a vehicle from going through. Also, they have gates which stop the trains and let the, the vehicles get the right of way. And uh, in the United States, we are starting to do two things. We are having uh, gates that cover all lanes of traffic and uh, a sense of medium which prevents uh, vehicles from going around the gates. And there are, uh, where, the, where the distance isn't too great, we have gates that cover the entire roadway. Uh, those gates are, are, are not as common uh, as one would hope they would be. In most cases, the gates that you see are gates that just cover uh, one direction of traffic. And that's where there is the opportunity for uh, someone to go either walk around or to drive around the gate. And that's obviated by the center medium or the gate that covers all the lanes. I hope that answers. Okay, so we have one more question. It's a very specific question, Carl. So uh, I guess you best, or if you don't know it, maybe um, where, where he could find this information. But Matthew asks, how can I find out uh, whether Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, urban city transit trains, um, that were maintained in 1984 have maintenance or trackside downloads available? Uh, that's, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there's a, there is a possibility, uh, but I would, I, would, I would say that that I don't know exactly what SEPTR is, uh, you know, da trackside downloads are. That's something that would have to be asked as part of a disclosure or request for information, freedom of information, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm sure that that information could be attained from them. Uh, I'm not so sure if that information would be still available, would have been retained from that from 1988. Okay, Carl, let's move on with the presentation of content. Okay. Uh, let's uh, now talk about the passions on track. Uh, this is an actual uh, picture that, uh, uh, that we're taking by uh, passive buyers of passengers that have fallen uh, from, the tr from the track or just went onto the track and sat there. And uh, the picture on the right is a, is a, is a mir miracle. This happened in Europe where uh, this, this platform was graded towards the track. Uh, a tram, a baby stroller, they call them trams in Europe, rolled onto the track and thank God the train operator was very alert and stopped within uh, inches uh, of this uh, child in the tram and nobody was hurt. In, in Japan, they have a more aggressive system, and now there is consideration in the United States of doing the same thing, and that's uh, putting up walls uh, where the train can only stop at, at particular openings, and also uh, installing elevated doors on the platforms to prevent uh, people from falling onto the track. And this is uh, some of the things, uh, some of the reasons that people fall from uh, from platforms, uh, besides. Uh, uh, them accidentally uh, uh, falling on the tracks so for some other reason. Uh, we've had many cases where people have dropped, dropped their belongings, cell phones, briefcases, uh, hearing aids, and gone on the tracks. And unfortunately, uh, they retrieved the item, but they had never made it back onto the platform before the train arrived. And uh, one of, uh, there are cases also where crowding has resulted in people being pushed onto the tracks uh, and in some cases, uh, they've been struck by trains. In other cases, uh, they fell backwards and struck their heads on the, on, on the rails, uh, and uh, the consequence was the same. 
one thing to bear in mind, a pedestrian is unlike a, a motor vehicle. Uh, a pedestrian can take action very quickly and, and very successfully to avoid a train if they're aware of the train train's presence. A vehicle is, is a, move, reacts very slowly, can't back off, move forward as quickly as a pedestrian can respond uh, when they're in the track right away. Uh, pathways uh, provide the space for travel uh, across the tracks, and they should be designed in a safe manner. Uh, there have been many injuries because of the gaps between the the walkway and the flange of the of the of the tracks. A safe crossing should have these attributes: uh, it should be clear, visible, continuous path. They should be at an appropriate interval that people are not tempted to cross the tracks in between because the distance between crossings is so long. The, the, the waiting distance or the waiting time should be of a short duration. The, tr the physical treatment should be a good one, and there should be uh, security such as lighting, and the pedestrian should feel safe while making the crossing. And, of course, it should meet the ADA guidelines. The, the, the design of the crossing should have durability, compatibility, should be smooth, should be of a proper width, so that people can walk uh, side by side, and a third person could cross the tracks, uh, cross uh, the crossway at the same time. Uh, this is an important thing. Uh, people should be aware of the crossing and uh, and to and to take note that you know that there is a potential danger if they don't follow the rules of the road. And uh, let's say you know if it's between the train and the person, the person is never going to win. I mentioned before about the crossing and the uh, and the flange. Uh, it's important to have a, a minimum gap in the flange area. You can see this is an old-fashioned crossing. Uh, these crossings still exist. In fact, I have a case where the crossing is was like this, and and one day after the accident, it became like this, which is quite interesting. There are various companies that make materials that even make that flange opening even narrower. They have what they call a flange filler, and this is a picture of that uh, crossing treatment. There are also uh, systems, uh, rather than having a gate uh, at the crossing, uh, the traditional gate, having a more uh, uh, restri restrictive gate, where, which you're physically preventing people from making the crossing until the gate's open. This is a more positive approach. People tend to cr cr go around and under these particular People have a lot of impatience, especially if the train is sitting in the station, and they say, ah, the train isn't moving yet, and they start crossing. These are some examples of crossovers and uh, the designs which uh, are safe for all types of uh, pedestrians, uh, whether they're uh, pushing a stroller, uh, have a child in hand, or just crossing on their own. And this is some examples of of uh, positive approaches to uh, crossings is one that you can ha can't help but miss, not miss. Uh, one serious uh, issue is at crossings is that one has to be cognizant that uh, the train that one train uh, may have passed that's going in one direction, but uh, unbeknownst, a train may be coming in another direction. This is another system that was designed to make a light rail system, which is an at-grade system with gates to make it safe for pedestrians uh, and also passengers. Another thing that's important uh, is that uh, we need to make sure that the pedestrian has a satisfactory sight distance so they can see that the train is approaching and they can uh, deal with that in an appropriate manner. I mentioned uh, just before a uh, train coming in one direction and the, the train passes and the person feels that who's crossing now, everything is fine, and they start crossing, and a train comes in the other direction, and you know what the consequences of that uh, situation are. There are uh, good sign systems out there. The Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices has a good series of signs that uh, train properties can take advantage of and use in terms of making their crossing safer. There are emergency notification signs in case something if the gates don't work or some issue at the crossing, these numbers can be called and immediate action will be taken. Uh, there are regulatory signs uh, which provide guidance uh, uh, where, where to stop or not to, not to stop or those kinds of things. Uh, 
also in the manual uniform traffic control devices. There are also uh, bells and uh, flashing lights. This is the bell and flashing light. In addition to this will warn of an approaching train, as well as uh, don't forget trains come in two directions when there are two tracks. Or sometimes uh, there's a one track and, tra and, uh, and, and, and trains use it in different directions. And if you look one way, you may not uh, catch the train which is at that particular instant coming the other way. Uh, pedestrians need information to make decisions, and that's very, very important. These are the pedestrian information needs uh, that, and I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. You can come back and look at it. These are, this is the kind of information. Information needs to be redundant, and it must be uh, keep it simple. Uh, the keep it simple, stupid principle applies to information because if you provide too much, too much information, that sometimes can be a problem. I've seen signs which are bilingual where you, the message is uh, in 15 words or less in two languages, and the, in, the, in, in the Spanish translation, uh, they use Castilian, where most immigrants to the United States uh, use Mexican Spanish or South American Spanish, and not Castilian Spanish, which we learned in high school, and which is not used commonly by uh, persons who have been educated in, an, in a Spanish-speaking environment. Crossing accidents, uh, uh, the components of that are the, the grade crossing, the design considerations and solutions, and this sign uh, says look and listen, and which is what one should do. Uh, these are some examples of fatal accidents at railroad crossings. Uh, these are recent accidents, and there are many, many of these. Uh, we mentioned briefly about driving around the gates, and these are some examples of that. Uh, driving around the gates. Uh, uh, there are cases where, and this is uh, by uh, uh, pre-actuated uh, signals, uh, uh, in Florida they're using them to prevent being trapped between the tracks uh, where there are intersections and there's a long space between intersections. Uh, they are now uh, locating the warnings at a, a pre-actuated basis uh, some distance so that people, uh, vehicles don't get trapped or people get tracked on the tracks as the train comes through. Uh, stalled vehicles, that happens. Uh, it's a serious situation. Uh, that's why we have uh, buses stop before proceeding. And don't forget, trains can stop uh, quickly. And uh, some of these other things we've already uh, uh, have discussed already. Uh, the safety issues that I mentioned before, uh, these, are, uh, these were not... Uh, uh, stage. These are actual pictures that experts took of individuals just uh, violating uh, the safety of, uh, of crossings or not crossing at the proper location. And making that is even worse that people, because of the uh, floor, of the ground environment, people tend to look forward, uh, tend to look down and not forward, uh, so as not to trip on the uh, on the stones or on the tracks and fail to watch uh, for trains approaching. These are some of the leading causes of uh, crossing accidents. Uh, as I mentioned, that over the last 30 years they've declined, and this reduction could be in, as a result of the number of crossings and, the, of course, the increasing number of, uh, uh, of, of positive uh, train control, at, uh, positive uh, vehicle and pedestrian control through gated crossings. But these are uh, just a, a sample list of the, the, the lists that go on and on and on and on. Uh, there are hundreds of different reasons why these accidents occur. Uh, one question that's always being asked is uh, uh, whose responsibility is, is, is the crossing? Uh, there are shared responsibilities uh, by the railroad, by government, and by the driver pedestrian. I see we have a couple of questions. Uh, Matt? Um, yes, uh, we do. We have a couple of questions that have uh, come in uh, over the past five minutes. If you want to you want me to read them out loud for you? Could, could you? Yeah, definitely. Lisa asks, are there any special provisions for the disabled at pedestrian railroad crossings? Uh, there, is, there are designs for the crossing. Yes, there are. The American Disability Act uh, to prevent uh, wheelchairs from getting hung up, from, from preventing uh, people on crutches from getting hung up. Uh, there are standards. And the American Disability Act has some of those standards. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Blake who asks, uh, what are your thoughts on tra train-mounted warning devices, horns particularly? 
Are they adequate or inadequate as far as a warning device for uh, vehicles go? Uh, the, the, the trains have sometimes a combination of bells, whistles, and horns. And uh, if, if, we, if, uh, it, it, it's, it's, if somebody has good hearing, it's great. Uh, elderly people have less of, less of hearing. Uh, I've done some uh, sound studies where you couldn't hear the train because of <coughs> the modern train systems have uh, welded rail and, uh, and much improved engines and what have you, and you cannot hear the train uh, until it's almost on top of you. So that system is very important, but if a person is hard of hearing, they're not going to hear that. Uh, so you've got to take into consideration what is the population that's using the crossing in terms of considering uh, the use of that. And then we have these uh, areas that have been designated as quiet zones where the uh, train is, is obliged not to use the horn, <coughs> bell or whistle, because of, of the residential area. Uh, there are now uh, work going on where there are uh, what we call intelligent transportation systems on the train where the train uh, has uh, a system which will alert them if somebody is intruding on the right-of-way in front of the train. This system, hopefully in the next 10 years, will be implemented and will provide a great deal of safety for uh, those uh, to prevent trains from striking uh, uh, people that are uh, happen to be on the tracks at the time of the train. Okay, excellent. We have a question here from Blake who asks, what about vehicle stalling to roughness of the crossing grade? Does that, would you say that, does that, how does that play with the uh, manual and uniform traffic control devices? Well, the manual and uniform traffic control devices is, is deal strictly with signage and information. Uh, the manual that you want to look at for this case is, uh, is the Federal Highway Administration's manual on highway grade crossings, third edition. Okay, excellent. Uh, I don't see any other uh, questions in the queue, so why don't you continue on, Carl, um, with, I guess, uh, your final remarks. Is it all right if we go over a couple of minutes? Uh, sure, go for it. Okay. Uh, again, uh, driver pedestrians, uh, they have a responsibility to look for trains. They can't depend on, on the train operator being able to deal with every situation. Uh, time is, you know, is a, is, 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 is a pedestrian's enemy. Um, one of the things that, that has been studied is uh, the ability to judge arrival time. And most studies have found that uh, vehicle operators and uh, pedestrians have a difficult time in judging uh, the arrival of a train. And uh, the reason for that uh, was, was discovered, uh, uh, Leibowitz did not do any studies. He hypothesized, just like Einstein hypothesized his uh, theory of relativity, uh, Mr. Leibowitz, Dr. V. Leibowitz did something similar. And, uh, and he was dealing with the ability to judge the speed of, uh, of uh, trains. We all know about large airplanes, when we're under an airplane, it looks like it's standing still, and it's moving even slower than small planes, and that's because of its height and distance and uh, our inability to make that judgment. Uh, Leibowitz's hypothesis, which was developed in 1985, uh, was confirmed in 2003 and 2006, and I guess uh, Einstein wasn't as lucky because just last month uh, they found that Einstein's theory of light and relativity was off by one millionth of a nanosecond. Uh, don't ask me how big a nanosecond that is, but they said that uh, Einstein was off by that amount. These are some of the factors that could be applied to reduce accidents. Uh, we can apply warning systems, uh, how we design the crossing, is the crossing perpendicular, or on a skewed angle such as this particular crossing that I show here in, the, in this photograph. Uh, what type of active control devices are being applied? Uh, we've, uh, so in one way or another, we've mentioned all of these. Uh, it was mentioned by one of uh, the participants about the long arm gates and uh, the ability of, of gate crashing, going around the gates or even going through the gates. And uh, one thing that's worked very, very well and is seeing more and more application and that's this medium separator. It's impossible to go around the gates with a medium separator. And also the four quadrant gates uh, help reduce that somewhat, but uh, people have found ways of getting around the four quadrant gates. Uh, the pedestrian solution that works the best 
is uh, having the, the pedestrian gates, which I mentioned before. Uh, the locomotives, in addition to having bell, horn, whistles, have a, a wide variety of lights uh, which, and, and reflective materials that make it uh, very easy to see a train in, in the evenings in the, with the visibilities. And uh, even the subways and the metros and the commuter rails, uh, they have these... Uh, 300 par, 25 uh, head beams, which uh, can, uh, I've uh, had the opportunity of being able to measure there, and they have a significant distance that they throw their light uh, forward of, of the uh, moving vehicle. Uh, one thing that, that has worked very well, and they're applying this in, uh, in, 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 in cross in major intersections in Florida, where you have the tri-rail coming through and freight, and that's uh, the preemption where the uh, the signals are preempted, whether it's by the train or by the approaching traffic, uh, and to ensure that uh, traffic doesn't co get caught in the in the intersections. And this is a little bit more information on how preemption works, and this is some of the new railroad crossing technology that will enable the vehicles and the trains to know if anyone is entering the intersection and that they have to take action. And there is more technology beyond what I'm showing here. Uh, there is, uh, for the constant violators, uh, we're now using photo enforcement and giving major fines to those who violate the rules. And, uh, you know, once you get a couple hundred dollar fine a couple of times, you don't violate the rules again. And uh, what I mentioned earlier is this motion detection uh, equipment that is being uh, tested right now. And, and uh, in fact, for juice, the Japanese have uh, to pet, used it effectively, and they found that it's worked very well in terms of wheelchairs and, and bicyclists uh, uh, being detected in the railroad crossings. These are uh, individuals that have more difficulty getting out of the way of the train as compared to a pedestrian that's just walking. Uh, they're also working on collision avoidance systems to avoid these kinds of, these kinds of incidents. And this is the, the gate I was mentioning that has the ability of stopping a 40 mile per hour truck uh, from breaking through and this is being tested for, and it's, it's manufactured by B&B Armor Corporation. I mentioned earlier the uh, the crossing schools that are in existence in Australia. Uh, every child is, is required to take a course at a crossing school and they uh, in Australia they have uh, many many railroad crossings that are uncontrolled or, or have limited control, and this has worked very, very effectively. And they've introduced this type of school on Long Island, and uh, we yet to know whether uh, uh, this is the uh, the case. Uh, there are a lot of Samaritan organizations out there that are providing information and helping uh, prepare children all over the world, and they're doing quite a good job in terms of training, communications, and outreach. And if your community is not doing it, I would bring it to their attention, or the OLI program, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and in the end, we all have a duty of care. Uh, if we know of a hazard, let's bring it to people's attention. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, employees are properly trained, that uh, in uh, safety inspections are ongoing, that standards are up to date, and uh, communications are effectively uh, utilized. Uh, this is a, a, a widely shown photograph that you can find on the intersection and it's the crossing ghost, and it's to remind everyone that should somebody have a fatality at a crossing, uh, this ghost will be out there to uh, provide warning in the future. I thank you very much. Uh, are there any other last-minute questions, uh, Matt, that we need to take? Um, I don't see any in the queue, so I will wrap things up. Um, Dr. Berkowitz, thank you for the time and effort that you put into this presentation. I think... Everybody who is in attendance can agree that uh, it was quite thorough and informative, so, so thank you. Um, for those um, who are still in line with us, if you would like to speak to Dr. Berkowitz about a case, uh, you can contact us here at TAS. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319, or you can email us at experts at com. As I mentioned during the introduction, we'll be sending out the link to the archive recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. The archive recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous webinars, are posted in the TASA Knowledge Center. To get to our Knowledge Center, visit tasanet.com and click on Knowledge Center, 
at the top level navigation and then click on webinars and you'll be directed to the webinar section. Our next client focus webinar, Electronic Medical Records and Coding, Keys to Correct Coding and Compliance, will take place on November 15, 2011 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments, please feel free to email me at any time. Uh, we do take all the comments under consideration and they help us to present better programs. So please do uh, feel free to drop me a line at any time. With that, I will end today's program. Uh, we thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you at future passive events.